During the days of COVID-19 pandemic, Halka Sanat Projesi and Artship Initiatives have come together to create a series of lectures given by Slobodan Dampaic, the director and principal researcher of Artship Initiatives, uh, in order to reunite with their audiences, friends, and colleagues. The first lecture is entitled Management Ambiguities, NGO, Charitable, Not-for-Profit, Spontaneous Initiatives. And it was a paper delivered on the fifth International Management and Social Sciences Conference in Istanbul in July 2020. Mm -hmm. We are recording so, now. Okay, Slobodan, if you like. We yeah, can we can start okay. and then as people come in, we'll just... Um, let them in. I'm yeah, looking at the participants, don't worry. Um, so, um, I just want to, to say a few words about this discourse. And that is that... Um, Art and management are often not associated together. Um, the management uh, currently, and currently even for last uh, 20 years, um, it's trying to be science. So it's um, trying to use the social science uh, methodology to justify certain things. And why not? Each discipline has its own rights. But um, kind of management of small initiatives, of um, non-for-profit, it's much more confusing because it's lateral. Of course, it has its own um, structure, not to call hierarchy, its own structure. But it's also lateral and personal and brings all kinds of things which are usually suppressed in a management field. So that's why I called it management ambiguities. And both in the paper and in the lecture, it was a great discipline and I loved it to talk about it, not as we did it, I did it, me so it's not like a facebook it's not like a promotion but to talk about it as if it happened to someone else but not as an affectation but as releasing from personalities into what happened the best one can remember as i remember it so it will be different so that kind of the personal part is the limitations of my memory, but the discourse, I would talk most of the time in third person. Also, some of you have been there. You know who the third person is, but nevertheless, if we participate in that sense, then it would liberate from the personality aspect of it. So then I try to share the screen and I just start. So here I press, here is my PowerPoint. Here is the full screen. And um, we begin. And this is a very discreet uh, a diagram of ambiguities because, oh my God, one planet is going a different direction. So at this time of COVID, um, an old man took exercise every day to a bench which was about two blocks um, from where he lived. And he has never been in touch with pigeons but he decided to feed them because some of them were really dying because there was no humans to give them food. So suddenly 
And actually first, the weaker ones, and you see the one has one leg which is injured, they all injure their legs in the urban environment and they're quite ill, lots of them. And the weak ones are first ones who ascend there until suddenly the big bully arrives and he starts ordering everybody around. And the feeding hand, not really knowing, very gently, as he was an old man using a stick, uh, pointing uh, to the bully and everybody stops. And the bully looks at the end of the stick and if it's just taken millimeter, centimeter, little, it, it responds. Then it tries to go to the food and the feeding hand moves and it stops. The feeding hand with the other hand tries to give the food to the others and they would not touch it unless the bully goes first. So this kind of dynamic is um, in all kinds of structures, politics, history, management, there is um, executives, the, the, the um, I called him here bully, but not all of them are bullies and some of them are caring humans. And then there is the populace, the community, the workers, the people who are really the constituents. And often there is a confusion between the feeding hand and the executors. And some executors actually um, identify and think that they are the feeding hand. So that dynamic is kind of an underpinning of um, management issues. The other one is communal bonding. And we derogate wolves as howling animals but they actually do polyphonic singing to enjoy being together. And um, I was trying, but I couldn't play the music in this, so it's not there. The animals, and particularly the wolves, also have mirror neurons, and the little ones learn and imitate and behave exactly how the wolf is supposed to be. So the communal bonding is something which is closer to the small initiatives through the um, community concerned organizations than to the big um, concerns. And there is, um, um, th these are the ancient singing, which is in Corsica, Sardinia, uh, Sicily, based and inspired by wolf singing, and people do it for communal bonding. In Albania, I don't have an image of it, in Albania, they um, sing it first when there is a community problem to resolve, and then they discuss all make decisions about it. So this howling for communion, for being together, this harmonizing moments are of great interest here. So before I go into the smaller um, non-profits and initiatives, I want to visit this one uh, which is uh, the International Peace University. Uh, Archie was involved with them for seven years, five years actively, and I would uh, touch that when the Archie comes. But what was very interesting, the um, university basically split into the ones who were happy to have big international conferences with um, um, 
Nobel Prize laureates, 12 of them first, then 17 later, who endorsed it and they came to talk and in elegant hotels and then nothing happened. Then in next year in another elegant hotel and so on so forth, so in the same one. So, and then there were few people who actually did some teaching, trying to do classes, and the archive was to be and was part of it and did some classes. And here the uh, celebrity values was more important than the presence of people who really did something. Uh, but nevertheless, the people who endorsed this initiative, uh, which, you know, it's a substantial nonprofit field and somebody needs to even just talk about it. So now I want to show you a completely different uh, uh, initiative, and that is um, reclaiming a very difficult park in East Oakland, which had a theater in it, which was built um, at, um, in the 40s as a kind of workforce uh, gathering and job giving initiative. And it was used until the 60s, then it was burned and became a center of criminal activity. So the citizens and the neighbors came together and they invited Archip Ensemble, which had different names. Augustino Dance Company was first of their names to regenerate the theater with children telling stories of the community, what they remembered of their grandparents. Of, and the performance was called, um, ah, now my, my mind is um, uh, going, Windfall of Memories, yeah. The first boy, um, now sings on Broadway. He has been part, serious part of um, Augustino Dan's company and um, he's wearing a crown of ties on his head. But the other uh, boy was a Latino boy who was very embarrassed of being on the stage. And he <coughs> um, wanted to help so the um, costume was designed and he was going around watering the, the park. And the children and the people were shown some historic photographs, not media images, to uh, broaden their horizons or just experience. And one song was created directly inspired by that. There was a one um, performer who said, who tells me I cannot be a ballerina? And um, it was uh, beautiful and she had a great sense of humor, but also musicality and movement. And then the actual members of the dance company integrated with the community and did some lyrical, beautiful, meaningful um, enactments. This is an enactment of a historical memory portraying um, a grandfather as someone thoughtful and elegant and remembering the story. And uh, one boy was really talented and good, um, had a fantastic story, but his father was trying to forbid him to do it, you know, because there is so much feuds around there. But he so much wanted it, and then he came to the oldest member of the com company and said, I'll do it if you're there. So quickly a costumes was made for this person and the boy performed. So uh, they were, gang wars, people lost their brothers, they lost their 
um, family members and the way how the community galvanize around this make it more direct and more immediate than some rhetorics in a great hotel. So here is a very simple example, simple uh, only in a sense of um, it's uh, out of form, but it's uh, profound that again, management in art is um, not really looked at carefully. And IPEC has um, uh, taught it in um, various uh, universities um, and uh, had a groups of interns who were really learning the art of managing on viscerally, physically. So it's not something theoretical. You have to look at the work. You have to find the glue for the work. You have to know which photocopy place will be right for such things, to know the importance of framing, of putting gallery back into how it was before the exhibition. All of these things are day-to-day -day work. And if they are not understood and practice, the you know, dysfunction of galleries and the snobbism of galleries and the fashion orientation of galleries becomes more important than honoring the work. So, thinking about it together is what this initiative did, the Halka Sanat Projects. And these were the interns. People like everyday people, loving art. So, um, this is a more complex project, but um, I'll go through it. And um, introduction to it is really the crisis of modernism, and particularly in architecture. It was solved and dominated uh, the world a little bit like the cell phone is today. All the municipalities suddenly adopted the idea that social problems will be at least rhetorically solved by the housing estates and, you know, the next election will be won. So these places became all over the world. This is the most um, well known in St. Louis. It was so difficult and the materials were so cheap. Five years after it was build it begin to deteriorate. So in the end, there was so much crime, so much suicide, so much difficulty, it was um, um, detonated. So this was uh, Le Corbusier's ideal city. Well, we have been living in it and we know how ideal it is. So this is just preamble about this project. This is just a very schematic, uh, quick, um, even bad drawing. But in that spirit of modernism, the college was built in the outskirts of London, um, part, still part of London, but kind of just on the Essex-London border. And um, they completely ignored the hill. They put this box and then, and it was, um, talk about uh, disabled access was completely inaccessible, but nobody cared. But also, on the college, a strange place emerged going, you know, in the, in the end, you one would have to crawl back there. You know, it was hill, forgotten hill. And the first principle of the place, they were trying to put uh, concrete and um, close it, but the first principle of that place ask 
to be used as a storage. So it was dark and they called it void. And eventually the door was open where an initiating teacher got a job there and there was nowhere to, to give him um, a classroom because he was not in the art department, which was very Bauhaus and modernist. He was to teach uh, uh, theater and puppets and neighboring um, drama school arranged it with the principal. So this um, teacher was put into the um, uh, liberal studies department. And um, by looking around the college, he decided to use this place as his workshop. And it became a haven for people who were basically dropping out, who were from different backgrounds, recent immigrants, or just could not cope with the, you know, the pressures of the college, as well as students. It did uh, theater arts, you see the little model there of the theater, several of them. It had a huge collection of um, costumes and um, things, so people can use them and play with them. And um, it also had a box. You see that little brown box next to the sewing machine? Every day, people, about between 15 and 20 people, would put a little bit of money into it, never was counted. Somebody went to the supermarket and bought enough food for everybody, and it was much healthier. And some people can only afford a few coins, but there was always enough because they couldn't afford the canteen. Also, uh, the initiating teacher allowed people to come there, listen to the classes, uh, who were not enrolled in the college from the community. The, apart from theater and puppets and that, um, he, although his English was not good at that time, initiated a uh, history of art and um, ideas project. He introduced Asian um, art into the curriculum and went to the whole of the embassies in London and got free films to show them in these classes. So people would have, you know, now everything is on the web, but in those days you didn't have access to all of that. So in the end, it was decided to close it as a fire risk because it became, you know, People didn't like the idea that people were not enrolled in a college, they don't know who they are. So the place was to be closed. So um, to save it, um, the initiating teacher uh, drew a kind of building where, and that's what I was trying to see, but the picture you see on the blackboard, you can barely see it. But there was a building and you would see it in a minute. There was a building and a concept and a grand building in this little dingy place, which was not dingy because it was full of interesting things. It was like a living museum, uh, a garage sale, the, the jumble sale. Um, but as they were closing it, uh, the initiating teacher was in the library and at the back of an architectural magazine there was an advertisement for a UNESCO competition, architectural competition for new ideas in lifelong learning and communities. So he drew a building based on a hexagonal um, shape, which um, soap bubbles do when they come together. And um, different aspects of the le learning this building express. So in the middle, maybe if I do it with the, yeah, this part 
oops, it changed the slide. Uh, so I shouldn't press. Yeah, this part was called unorganized resources. And it was like the place in the, you know, in the void where all kinds of materials from the community were there. Then there were organized resources around and um, they were teaching halls given each to a teacher to create an atmosphere, not just to come and the idea, and this is schematic, to point out then if one lives one's subject, it's different than if one is just reciting it. So it's not how, you know, some classes have to move out, but as a concept of a teacher living. And then the students were to build uh, different buildings around the teacher. They have affinity of the time. So the building began to grow. In the middle of the hexagon was um, a spiral staircase leading into a dome. And slowly an idea emerged of this different elements of the building. You see just faintly on the side, the um, uh, student buildings. And on the top was to be this ship-like place where if somebody wants to watch the view or be alone for a while, they can be there. So, uh, that's the dome. It was, um, again, just as a symbol of um, possibilities, was to be made out of uh, uh, 365 hexagons, integrating the curriculum, showing some stars at a certain period of the year, being something living, which discussion at the beginning of the year comes and different images are put into it. So here is just as if, but the paper talked about adaptability. So um, it isn't an ideal building in an ideal situation, but all of that, all of those principles happen in that void, in that place. And then initiating teacher, um, needed a la illustration for the last uh, chapter. He didn't have it. He was invited to do the drawings in summer holidays in Scotland, where there is lots of uh, bad weather. And there was a hexagonal barn on that place where he was staying. So it gave an opportunity to, to show an adopted version of it. But it really said, a chalk circle on a ceiling in the original void is as symbolic and strong as all of these edifices. And in the paper, because it was also um, curriculum and um, exploring the ideas paper, at the end it gave an example of um, caves in um, southern Italy, where refugee monks who fled for s several reasons earlier because of, from Byzantium, from Constantinople and Byzantium, first because of the iconoclasts, they fled because, you know, there is also Byzantium in uh, southern Italy, in the end, the Catholics um, dominating it. And also during the, the takeover of uh, Ottoman and um, uh, the, the patriarchs and the synod uh, in a way betrayed the empire because they knew that they will be the central power. So some monks who objected to that had to flee and they built these small caves with a tiny little dome, not Hagia Sophia, not anything extraordinary, like a little pudding basin. And so um, this symbol of adaptability and the paper talk, talked about 
the need of flow of coincidences. So you might see that drawing a little more in this one. And so, in southern Italy, there was a British couple next to this um, Baronessa Maria Vittoria Colonna, descended from Michelangelo's patroness Vittoria Colonna. And um, she had this estate with this uh, extraordinary, some of these buildings are prehistoric. And it was abandoned because most people went to uh, Switzerland and Germany to work, and they were not uh, anymore um, doing agricultural land, and this was the summer dwellings of, of them. And um, Baronessa Maria Vittoria Colonna lived in the summer in this little 15th century castle, surrounded by this um, truly. And so the neighbors gave her this, um, she spoke French, it was written in French, and um, she was very excited. She had a cave, Byzantine cave in her place, and all of these trulies. We came and talked to her in um, some times, um, and then um, it was decided to be the summer school. So a foundation was created in London to administer, and it was a very, run on very, very minimal funds. And most people there were completely urban. We have never carried one single stone in our life, let alone um, do all of these things, mend old buildings, and learn how to make pigments, paper, fresco painting, printmaking, all of those um, visceral tasks. And also learning how to be together as urban individualists too, which also has its own challenges. But the integrative part of um, the project was to build a tiny little lake because that place had unique stream in the uh, province. And um, since prehistoric time, people have been there. And at the end of the fertile land, it goes into the stone. So the um, project decided to make a lake, to, to learn how to do that. And, um, integrate, everybody worked on the lake. So it took um, three years to build, leaving it in the winter to grow and learning from the plants, how to put them around, bringing them rosemary and thyme and all those wild herbs and uh, making them adopt. And so in the end, the lake was completely adopted by nature. This is just at a time of filling. So the visceral learning, something which now it's becoming almost extinct. And um, one of the advocacies of hardship is to find a way how to balance visceral and um, virtual. So some children, some people have space and time to use their hands, to feel something, to be together in work, working. And this was the tool um, where people return at the end of work, the tool. So there was a certain discipline of respect to work and to artfulness. So, with the difficulties of the urban situation I was telling you, and with tremendous um, um, difficulty in uh, high schools, particularly in Oakland, um, this initiative decided to do projects which would integrate um, 
university learning, uh, lifelong learning, and skills for teenagers, culinary skills and maritime skills. They went a um, small initiative of um, citizens, few artists and parents um, went through Congress for five years to get this ship for free for Oakland. And it was called Art Ship because artists are the model of perseverance. Um, youth has no, nowhere to, to, to see that model. They don't even see how their parents are learning because the parents are not learning. Now, youths have no idea how much daily practice one has to do and commitment and passion and sacrifice to play well in three, three days, to draw um, figures and so, in the end, one is a master of figures, not just um, a dilettante. So um, there were lots of activities on the ship, which when the children and the um, teenagers came, they witnessed. This is the maritime training. But they would be witnessing the um, people rehearsing, performing on mountaineering ropes. Um, the figure on the right hand, it's Katrina singing. Um, and um, there was a performance about ship remembers because it was uh, one of its phases was in the Second World War. And so um, this play imagined the absence, feminine absence in a ship, which is in the fantasies and in the letters of the sailors. And here they danced on ropes, on the 30s, uh, late 30s song with heels. And um, the captain there took the audience and into the um, bows of the ship, and that's where the performance took place. So, uh, also um, training for professionals. This is the young teenagers in Oakland who were interesting to become architects. So this is them enacting the first ever building within the sense of their roots and their tradition. And um, also the projects in the community involving many things, people, parallel to this um, International Peace University, which was to have curriculums on reconciliation and open problems. I don't want to bore you with reading this, but um, just um, like the last one says, conflict resolution curriculum for six to 12 year olds. There is, was a one lecture, oh, I think I have a, um, and this was one, to make is to be made, emancipating doing and making intelligence. The other one, very important one, was freedom of imagination precedes freedom of speech. And great commitment was done to demonstrate that. So in the end, the real estate, who was always uh, dubious about it, wanted to sea view for the development and they were able in spite of um, all the legalities of the ship were able to confiscate it and terminate the project but its spirit and ideas 
continue just like a chalk ceiling um, circle in the void. It's not about edifice. It's about survival and ingenuity. And um, we always in management talk about um, human resources, but very rarely we talked about human resourcefulness. And it's not the machine which would make us more resourceful. It is the listening. This little boy has never heard the in, um, Inca Indian singing. It's a friend of mine, um, anthropologist, his son. They were just walking and this uh, traveling musician in Belgrade, who had, nobody ever heard that. And you see some people are just passing, but this boy was fascinated. He sat there and just watched. His curiosity was natural. It was something he responded to. And the children recognized each other, mirroring each other. Their mirror neurons are active. They're learning about each other while the parents are shopping. So the simple processes of encouraging meaningful bonding might be a paradigm of management we could explore. Thank you very much. So I, I suppose I should get out of this. So there we are. It was great, thank you. My pleasure. Very moving. <laughs> Very moving indeed. If anybody wants to say something. You're dumbfounded. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. yeah my pleasure. My pleasure. Do you have and a pound or wolf and a fire? Oh, I do. Uh, it's on my desktop. Let's thank you for. Asking for that, it is so astonishing. Thank you, Slobodin. Oh, my pleasure. I have one question. Just listen to the wolves for the moment. Oh, sure.
So that was not Wolf Howling. Yeah, <laughs> let's hear your question. Let's hear your question. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, first of all. And um, in the base of uh, what you shared with us, uh, to me at least, it comes that um, the importance of intuition, even though, yes, we have communal uh, concepts and visceral um, importance, to, uh, this, but I think without individual intuition, um, I don't think it's possible, or maybe it's a very important fact. And of course, you know, I have experienced, and maybe everybody in this meeting, that when you are around a living teacher like you or <laughs> other living teachers, then that intuition really increases. But now my question is, does Archip and you have a program uh, for to address any of these things, any of being with you or having the program for intuition or different way of living right. through art, through art, of course, through art. Well, um, I, my view of creativity is uh, uh, as a byproduct of problems. So problem mm -hmm. could be um, internal, having just um, brush and paint and trying to do something, but also communal or other things. Then there are levels, psychological levels, which are deeply private and very individual. So they have to be treated with great care. Otherwise, uh, if one gives a class on intuition, it's like creativity. So then people do finger painting and scream, but so intuition is part of discretion. When it happens and it's recognized, that is confirming. Sometimes it's in a glance, sometimes it's just working, um, you know, creating a flyer or something, and few ideas come. So intuition is a gift. True, true. So if one tries to force it, or if one proclaims oneself as a teacher, that limits the people. Mm, I see. So it has to come out of the process. So in, when we work for the storytelling and the performance, and it comes from the person for the person. So mm -hmm. the part they play, it's really came because of the way how they are. Right. And giving them something which they want through the stylization of the story or through giving the space. So it's not something a teacher has system and then he gives or choreographer knows how to move or theater director. No. Um, Mette has grandmother and that his memory and what, what she did creates the most beautiful shareable story and in the process all kinds of things happen which one doesn't want to discuss because one would kind of um, um, concretize them. So, and in, in most um, um, cultures, sometimes the unspoken is the most important part, which came from being together. And, you know, I was, uh, dubious about Zoom because you know I am an old <laughs> man, but it is so beautiful. Then we are together and we are sharing this. You know, this is like um, sixty years of uh, I don't want to use the word struggle, but yeah, something like that. <laughs> A 
against the mainstream. So the synchronicity that we are together, it is for me, it's so beautiful from all the various, uh, from the most recent meetings to really all the history we've had. And so... Yeah. so Mm -hmm. So your suggestion is creating the container, creating the space would be one way, would be a good way of, uh, and, of and to, Yeah, and to have a reason. You know, to have to, a reason, correct. Yeah. You know, a reason which is outside oneself, a performance. Right. That, yes. That's something we get together or, you know, painting the wall or building a lake or something which would then the result of it will be the deepening. Yes, yeah. out of your correct. Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh, my thank, you. Yes. thank you. I have a follow up question to that, uh, if I may. Of course, please. So it's easy for you to uh, have people open up to you because, in order for them to show their art or their abilities, the unit. Uh, to give them some trust, some um, initiative, so that they might open up. But it is not always so easy for us to have other people open up to us or um, come to us and talk to us. So how do you think we could tackle with that problem? Well, first of all, people at uh, Izmir and at Ege open up to you and they don't open to other people because you understand them and you are not just a um, career teacher. So your question comes really from knowing that. And people don't open more to me than they open to you. Um, but you would think that I'm avoiding the the question, um, if one cares and one is not dogmatic, people feel sufficiently comfortable to open as much as it's reasonable. Also, people should only open when it's safe. And if people are open, too much because there is some idea of opening. I think that is um, um, kind of trying to own their openness. I don't mind people not being open because that is their safety. So the psychological safe space, I think it's more important than any expression. So if the expression comes from the safe place, and it's safe place is not something constant because the person will feel safe one day, but not next day. So the fluctuation of um, safeness is crucial to openness, in, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And great to see you here. The Slobo, but I have a question about what you called the struggle, or this, this last case you cited um, of the artship, where the real estate interests uh, you know, took over the space and, and ended the program. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you know, uh, those who are kind of going against the mainstream, challenging the status quo, um, it seems in the end, when we have these fights, we lose. And looking back, maybe using the hardship as an example, is there something different maybe that could have been done to have won that fight? And how do we get on the winning side more often of these things? Well, the winning side is that we continue. Mm -hmm. We are still called Arch. We have done most beautiful things with uh, yes. Halka and Istanbul. Mm -hmm. Never thought of Istanbul. 
So we have not stopped. You know, I just keep going mm -hmm. on, on whatever scale it is. I mean, this what we are doing today is, yeah. you know, Hulk lost its place in um, Kadikoi. Mm -hmm. Here, here, yes, this is very beautiful. Um, but nevertheless, the world is not uh, ready for exhibition and performances. But we are doing this. We are sharing it. We are simply just doing. Yeah. So, and you know, if I have to live in a street, I would. But um, I would do something with the people there. Mm -hmm. So it would continue. So, and it doesn't have to be on a municipal scale, you know? If one is um, genuinely caring for the taxi drive, they would know. And it's not just the tip one gives. Mm -hmm. And um, even if one doesn't have a sense of humor, I make jokes and, you know, they are obscure. But the intention to conviviality, things continue. But real estate and this and status quo, we are not against the status quo, we were contributing. Mm -hmm. Just my aunt is not in the same club as, not to use the name. So then we are the outside. Mm -hmm. There's so many outsiders, and they win in their own way. Not all of them, but some. So, um, in the building where I lived in San Francisco, there are um, lots of people I have known for 10 years, and they are horrified because I'm going to say hello in the elevator. And if I do, they look the other. In Istanbul, you smile to someone, you don't speak, I don't speak Turkish, and they smile back. So it's as simple as that. There are cultures which flow and cultures which grab or you know, people are embarrassed to live in this building where I live because they feel they have failed the American dream. But they have a roof on their head. So it's all a matter of scale. And status quo and this, well, it would be nice not to call it status quo if many people could have supported it. But it interfered with real estate. Okay, so that's, that's the fact of life. But thank you for your question. Thank you for your answer. And of course, silence is golden. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any more questions? So, so we are going to do two more, so you are all welcome. <laughs> and uh, Ipek thought of it to be um, third week in um, uh, November, second week in uh, 
December and first week in January. So there is some kind of intuition, some kind of pattern, poetic pattern in that. So it's not just um, mundane and practical. So in the second week of um, December, we'll do the one about the music. So you're all welcome and don't worry if you're busy and you forgot. That will be completely acceptable. And just lovely to see you all. Really. Lovely to see you too. So now who's going to be brave to press the button? <laughs> to leave. I can't leave it for us all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ipek. Thank you, Ipek. Thank you, Ipek. Bye bye. Thank you, Ipek and Slobodan. Thank you, Slobodan. Thank you, Ipek. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Slobodan. Thank you, Ipek. Bye bye. Bye-bye. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.